My name is Christian Ortiz. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. My practice is mainly orthopedics. I do a lot of sports, but just related to foot and ankle, and I do trauma as well. I went to medical school in Chile, uh, then I did my residency in Chile in another, in another university, and then I came to the States to do a formal fellowship in 1998. Um, and then I've been, I've been doing some other training in different parts, mainly in Europe, because uh, I was very much interested in increasing my experience uh, looking at another point of view, because I, I, I felt like I, I already had the American point of view, the South American point of view of things, but I was missing the European point of view that is very unique. Classification of uh, ankle fracture has a long history. Uh, we used to uh, rely a lot on AO classification, whether A, B, and C, meaning that B is the fracture at the level of the syndesmosis, C above the syndesmosis, A below the syndesmosis, and that tells you pretty much what is going around, but not everything because it doesn't tell you much about the medial side, the posterior malleolus. Another very old classification and very well known is the Lauge Hansen classification that tells you about the mechanism. And it, at the beginning it was intended to tell you uh, what mechanism produced the fracture so you could reverse doing the other movement completely the other movement around in order to reduce the fracture and put it in a cast and a lot of fractures do not match the patterns described in the Lauge Hansen classification so right now that classification is uh, not so much in use it's a little bit complicated but it's published everywhere and everyone knows that Every classification is intended to give you some insight about what is going on and then what you need to do. So the best classification is the one that tells you this is what is happening, this is what you need to do, so this is what the result you're going to get. And there's no classification that is completely uh, or 100% answering that. Uh, and that is particularly true for the ankle fractures, especially right now that we have so many controversies about it. We can say this is a Weber B, but we need to add more information. And the information we need to add is, what's going on on the medial side? Do we have a medial malleolar fracture that is transverse or oblique? If we do not have a fracture, do we have a deltoid injury that is complete or partial? Then we need to go back to uh, the posterior aspect of the ankle and uh, talk about the posterior malleolus and then go to the syndesmosis. And this is what we call the ring. If you have a ring that is cut in one part, it doesn't open. If you cut it in two parts, it's unstable and it separates apart. So if you break any of these parts of the ankle, that means lateral side, medial side, syndesmosis, posterior malleolus, you break two of them, that's an unstable ankle. So when I get information from an ankle fracture, I ask, is it unstable? And what kind of instability do we have? And what other injuries do we have? So then we need to move forward a little bit more because we used to make classifications uh, relying strictly on x-rays. Uh, hopefully we get waiver in x-rays to get more information, but sometimes it's not possible because the patient has pain. Uh, so right now we get CT scan, which is mandatory when you have a posterior malleolar fracture. Uh, it also gives you a lot of information about the syndesmotic injury. Now, right now, if patient can stand that, um, you can get a weight-bearing CT. And for the ligamentous injuries, an MRI is also useful. Treatment options for ankle fractures go all the way from conservative treatment to uh, surgical treatment. If you have an ankle fracture that is unstable, that means the ring is broken in two parts, uh, you probably need surgical treatment. And the reason for that is that if this ankle is unstable, it will move a little bit. 
So you need to restore the anatomy because the ankle, uh, if you take a look and you compare the hip, the knee, and the ankle, the ankle has uh, one third of the surface of the knee and the hip, one third of the width of the cartilage. It doesn't go into arthritis as commonly as the other joints unless you make it or you break the alignment. So the, that's why the main reason for ankle arthritis is malalignment. And the most common reason for malalignment in the ankle is a fracture. So you need to obtain perfect reduction and perfect anatomy in order to prevent or decrease the risk of arthritis. So right now we don't say that you need to reduce and get two millimeters or one millimeter, you need to get it perfectly done, anatomical reduction. And that's the goal for treatment, trimalleolar fracture, especially trimalleolar because they are the one that are more unstable are, and more difficult to treat. When you have a trimalleolar fracture, uh, reduction is critical, is the most complicated one of all the ankle fractures. Uh, you typically have comminution, so you need to be very careful about how you're going to plan your treatment. And in order to plan your treatment, you need to have a CT scan to take a look at the posterior malleolus. And if you have that specific type of the posterior malleolus in which you have uh, a line that is going all the way from the medial to the lateral side, and you have a sagittal split and some comminution, that's the very risky posterior malleolar fracture that needs to be treated with direct, direct approach and plate reduction. And there are several classifications uh, going from Bortonischek, Araguchi, Rammelt, and Stufkins, and they all end up with the same conclusion. The old rule about the 25% or one-third, one-fourth of the posterior malleolar in order to decide treatment is obsolete. Right now, you need to rely on the shape of that posterior malleolus that needs to be addressed using the CT scan. So once you have uh, that decision, you need to choose your approach because you, you are going to treat the posterior malleolus, the lateral, and the medial. And you, of course, can make just a straight approach from posterior, either medial or lateral to the Achilles, but then you will need to make two more approaches on the medial and the lateral side. For me, the best idea and the best way to uh, uh, face this problem is to go posterior medial and posterior lateral. With that approach, you, you get full access to the whole posterior malleolus. And if you need, you can use a posterior medial and a posterior lateral plate. If you don't reduce the posterior malleolus anatomically, the syndesmosis is never going to be well reduced. And we know uh, from several reports in the literature that at least 50% of the fractures that we operate, when we take a CT scan after the surgery, they show that the syndesmosis is poorly reduced and that may have an influence in arthritis. Once you have done that, you need to move into the lateral malleolus, and since you already have a lateral or posterior lateral approach, you, if you have available a plate that is designed to be used posterior lateral, is fantastic, because the approach is already done for that. If not, you can use a lateral plate. And it, it, it is nice if you, at the same time, have the option of using a nail that can be used with a minimally invasive approach uh, and that decreases the, uh, the aggression that you're going to have for the soft tissues. Then on the medial side, if you have a fracture, you need to think if the fracture is transverse, oblique. If it is transverse, you can use uh, percutaneous, I mean, you can use cannulated screws or you can use uh, these uh, conical shaped screws. Uh, if you have a sagittal split, having a hook plate is particularly useful because it solves that problem. Because it has been shown that you need to reduce every single fragment. It does influences the outcome.
because you have the, the uh, attachment of the ligaments in that area. And if you leave any loose fragments, they could eventually uh, create instability. They could eventually create impingement or they even could create arthritis. So that's the way you, um, you approach this trimalleolar fracture. If you have different options like a nail, lateral plate, postural lateral plate for the fibula, uh, screws, different kind of screws for the medial side, and um, hook plates for small fragments. And at the same time, you need to think about um, a ligament repair, maybe you need to put some sutures or an anchor and a suture for the medial deltoid ligament. When you are in front of this patient, hopefully you have everything handy. Uh, because if you do not have it, you run into surprises and then you have to improvise and come up with a solution that is suboptimal. Well, post-op protocol for trimalleolar fracture uh, is very interesting because if you take a look at the literature, it doesn't tell you much and it's very restrictive. So if you follow the literature, you're gonna keep your patient non-wavering for a long period of time. And what we're trying to do here is treat our patients better. And that means that we want to provide better fixation, stable fixation, anatomical reduction, less soft tissue damage in order to go for a quick recovery time and quick return to daily activities and sports. So if you have done uh, an anatomical fixation that is stable and that helps when you have anatomical plates, helps when you have uh, locking screws, helps when you use the proper instrumentation holding small fragments like with a hook plate, <clears throat> it helps when you did minimal damage using a nail instead of a big plate on the lateral malleolus. So if soft tissues behave properly, after a few days, you can start your rehab and you can allow your patient go full weight bearing as tolerated. I'm a big fan of early weight bearing, quick rehab, and quick return to early daily activities because patients need to do that. And that is very much appealing for athletes and active people. They want to go back walking, hiking, practicing sports. So right now we do not call, that's a simple anchor fracture. There are no simple anchor fractures. And that means that we need to pay a lot of attention. We need to get x-rays, CT scan for some of them, and we need to plan careful in order to avoid complications like ankle arthritis because they do not have a simple solution. That's why you need to prevent. That's the best way to solve the problem. Because when you end up with someone 30 years old with arthritis in the ankle, replacement is not a good solution. Fusion is not a good solution. There's no good solution. So the good solution is to prevent and do it properly.